My dear friends, I'm very happy to be here to show you the movie I have been shooting from 1950 to 1961. It shows my expeditions, my film work, which finally led them to my publications. It doesn't show Kathmandu, it doesn't show the towns, it doesn't show the temples. My Sherpa Ayla, who served with me all the years from 1950 to 62, and he stayed on there in the Tibetan Handicap Center. My first task was a geological survey of Nepal in order to find out whether the Himalayas are so rich in gold and diamonds as the same government wanted to believe. So I started my expeditions in the Terai. I was 13 the rocks and I made cross sections from the Terai up to the, across the Himalaya to the Tibetan border and back south again. In this process I covered about 14,000 kilometers on foot. My interest was for the rocks at the beginning, then in course of my field trips when I came into contact with the Nepali people in the villages, then uh, my interests were shifted from rocks to people. I remember once I had a party, attended a party when uh, the Russian ambassador asked me, how come you deal now with these so-called refugees? You have made your name as a geologist in the Himalayas. Then I asked him in the party, what is more important, rocks or human beings? So he didn't give any reply. But then was, that was my change, the change of my, uh, of my whole career or my, my profession. I'm glad I have been a geologist to study, be able to study the evolution of the Himalayas. But then I got much more interested in the, in the, in the people and their problems for development. One of the main problems was of course crossing of the big rivers. This one is somewhere soon close in eastern Nepal. It was a very pleasant crossing, at least for me. Very often I swam across the river when there were no strong currents. But my daughters were always afraid because the Dungas, as they were called, they were very narrow and the loads had to, to be upright in the, in the small boat and I was very much afraid that it would keep over. My porters did not know swimming, I think one single one only of our total crew of 12, he knew swimming. And my Sherpa Ayla always said, when I tried to cross swimming, he always said, sir, swimming no good. And he meant, of course, the crocodiles which I saw one when I just wanted to jump in the river in the Kali Gandak in the lower part. It looks like a, a log of wood coming down and I just wanted to jump in when it started moving. It was a crocodile. So the coolies are, the coolies called at that, that time the porters, they make their prayers for a safe crossing. And here the red crossing, the red cloths you see over there, these are my socks. During the first expeditions I used up every three weeks a pair of socks and very soon I ran out of spare socks. So I remembered 
in the Swiss Army, they were a mountain tribe, very well known. They never were uh, had put on socks in the army, but always uh, just such a woolen cloth, which they uh, had a special trick to wrap around their feet. And I applied the same with the results that I had not to change. I one pair of such uh, woolen, woolen cloth made in Nepal, very strong one, lasted for six months at least. This is one of the mold parto. You know the, the names for the roads and mold and partos and mold partos was, had quite a different meaning from today. A mold parto was a parto which you could see. It was it was a trail. Sano parto was no trail at all, and cola parto was a riverbed, nothing else. Here is one of the mold parto north south in the Sunkosi Valley, along the steep, the, the steep cliffs of the rocks on the side. And uh, it was rather dangerous at that time. Ah, that's another river crossing. Here is a river crossing, there was no Dunga. It was not a very big river, it was, the water was beautifully clear and warm, and I preferred to swim. And they made kind of a raft out of this uh, picos, called locally, over there. And uh, they made a raft and put our baggage over there, and uh, my porters had to, to to be attached themselves to this raft. There we crossed. I myself, I preferred swimming and having my own little raft for my own outfit. After all, when it was at the end of an expedition, I had all the field books and geological maps, which I had all notice on economic problems. I didn't want to lose it, and my cameras and everything. That is an air mattress, which I used, used as a bed. And this, at the right side, this is my office box. This was called, it had, uh, we could make a table out of it. On the other side, we could open the whole thing and uh, made a table out of it. And this was called by my portals, my portals, the little thing at Urbar. Monsoon, no possibility to travel in Nepal at that time. Outside the Kathmandu Valley, nobody was walking. My expeditions lasted from spring to autumn, but at the beginning I had one which lasted almost one full year, and then I got very sick. This is one of these makeshift bridges which has to be replaced or newly built after every rainy season because the local people were not able to build a suspension bridge high enough above the water level. And here the headman of the village explains to me how the people, the first wish of the people is to have a good suspension bridges. So when I had covered the whole country and I found so many wishes, 
the top priority of the wish of the people were let us have suspension bridges for safe river crossing. This man told me that how in last rainy season some people were killed in the floods when they tried to cross the river. That was the beginning of the suspension bridge building program, which was, I think, one of the most successful ones here in Nepal. And it has continued since its inception in 19, 1960. And uh, there are no longer any foreign experts working in it, but all Nepali. These are the beautiful trails of the ridges in the Midlands, where the Gurungs live, and the Tamangs, and the Rai, and all those. This is in eastern Nepal. Sobe Bamane is the mountain behind. This is Taulagiri, this is now in western Nepal, southern flank. And uh, it was, of course, very beautiful. I had a unique chance to see this virgin country. No foreigner had been there before. Foreigners were allowed only to come to Kathmandu or perhaps to Kokani or so, but otherwise it was the geological map was just right. Bacha Puchare. But I was as much impressed by the people as with the uh, high mountains. This is Annapurna South Summit. And I found out, to buy some price, that the cultural diversification is quite different from any other countries in the world. First of all, you have about 12 races, not just different languages, but races, three main races. And they were distributed in the country according to contour lines. In the lower parts, there were the Indo Aryans, that is the Chetrits, the Brahmins. In the central part, you had the Nevars and the hill people, that is the Guru, Tamang, Stakur, and uh, Limbu, the Rais, the Mangars, that is Rhododendron. I don't know, the colors are very, very bleak now, I think, must lie in the, in the copy of the, the movie because originally it's very colorful here. That is south of Lake of Annapurna, of Daulagiri. And these are all rhododendron trees in blossom in May. It took me three attempts here to come here to find the good conditions to shoot this. That means it must be months of May, which is not the best months for trekking, south of the Himalaya. Secondly, it must be clear in months of May Normally there is a haze that we had had here for weeks now, and certainly it must, must be good weather. So I had three, made three attempts to finally get this shot done. Here we are crossing the Namun La, that's in the eastern part of the Annapurna range. I could find the bloody pass, and uh, the map was obviously very wrong, and I was very much comforted when I learned later on that many other expeditions also failed to find the pass which had a quite different place than indicated on the map. But nevertheless, these high camps, they were the highlights of my expedition with a beautiful view on the high mountain. That is Taulagiri again. River crossing, this was the Berry River, almost it's the Uttargang, the upper course of over the course of Uttarganga in western Nepal. It was a very strong current. We had to keep it just so sometimes we had to use a rope to fix, uh, uh, make a fixed ropes along which uh, porters could walk. So uh, I had always an uneasy e feeling because none of them knew swimming and the current was very strong here. To, for such different crossing, I had to redistribute the loads because normally I had for each load I had 10 traders. Each one had always the same load. When for diff difficult uh, river crossings, I made a new distribution. I distributed the, the loads that, ev that everybody had everything, had a little bit of something, some food, some medicaments, some equipment and so on. Now this is Foxundo Lake where you enter from, what is the name, from Ringo, south to north, into the Dolpo area. I was the first in the Dolpo in 1952 already.
This is a moon party, you see my porters walking. It's a left side in the picture, along the cliffs. They walk over there, and during the winter, there's a permanent stream. There was of salt traders coming here. Of course, the Tibetans could not come down so far because the trails were too bad for using pack animals. While in Nepal, all the salt trade had to be performed in, uh, uh, by porters. You see my coolies over there. Coolies, that was the name at that time. They got a salary of two rupees per day and they had to buy their own food of it. And uh, they made quite good money with me because very often I bought the goat for all. They were keen on getting mazu. And so I bought the goat as an incentive whenever we had, that is Kanjiroba, Western Nepal, beautiful mountain. Then we had to cross a high pass, which was difficult for my partners and they were afraid. So I said, on the other side, you will get, you will get a goat, a changra. So we had all of them. It lasted about two or three days, and said we were vegetarian again. Normally I had sufficient uh, spare, power, spare shoes with me, but this time the shoes went, began to disintegrate, so we either tried to, to fix it with a rope of nylon there, and then I could walk about, about three weeks more with this until the expedition was at the end. The longest expedition was in 1954 when I went up to Dai Lake, Cha Kot, up to Simikot, and then to Mugu. And there in Mugu, I was very sick. My porters were also sick. And there was at that time the Indian Army had, had, uh, was at the check posts. And they had a radio connection with the Indian Embassy, and I asked them to send a SOS message, a reply wires from Kathmandu Indian Embassy, no time to receive your message. I had to get off very early every morning. So, but my chef Paila prepared always a break breakfast for me, and here then I made an agreement. When we didn't walk at sunrise, I was entitled to tear off the tent above, away from the sleeping quarters, and they had the same right with me. So it happened only once that I was standing there in my uh, underwear in the cold, and my porters too here. They were sleeping, I'm shouting around like hell, and now we're tearing away the tent. So we had to make this experience only once, and then it worked. They were watching me carefully every morning, and I was watching them which one could tease the other ones. <laughs> then I was, of course, using some bad words, and my porters, they learned this very fast. And I remember I heard once uh, one of my chief porter and I are saying, now, uh, go on, more fast, otherwise the uh, Harims are, we shout again, and then they use the words, little bit Nepalized. But ten years later, my successors, or the Swiss people who had my cooks and my Sherpas, they said, from where did you get all these bad words in the Swiss language? They said, from Harim Saab. So two loads of my ten loads altogether were medicaments. So this reporter, he had an infection on his toe. So I, uh, I treated him, I made surgical work. And only here I saw in the picture, when the bus was coming out, that I totally dirty fingers and fingernails. And I saw this movie at, at the UN headquarters at that time. All the big shots were there, and the chief of medical service was there, and he asked me, Mr. Hagen, what is your profession? I said, I'm a geologist. You are not supposed to do some, some uh, lousy medical work. And then I was... Uh, then I uh, asked him, in front of everybody there, I asked him, which risk is greater, that 
my dirty fingernails get infected by the pus, or the pus is, get, is getting infected by the, by the dirty fingernails. Of course, the reply he, he didn't give me any reply, but people laughed at this, but this man never forgot me. He revenged several years later when I was very sick, and then he found an excuse to give me no longer any normal contract, but only with, with limited liability. So, his portal was okay. I gave him penicillin injections, which worked miracles on his portals who had never had antibiotics before. Here is another case, I had an accident. One portal collapsed on a steep slope and was falling down the slope and then he was, he fainted. And he had some blood on his head, but it was only uh, from ex external wounds. But uh, I didn't know really what has happened to him. So I came with my coramine injections. I, I thought because I supposed it was a heat stroke. It was a very hot day. But my partners they didn't believe in my modern medicine. They uh, purchased uh, a chicken and sacrificed it together with rice and so they were praying and I was giving in the meantime my uh, penicillin injection to the porter. So two days later, the poor chicken is still alive. So two days later he worked normally, fairly normally and it has not been decided whether the chicken is held or the penicillin or, or the coramine. That boss Pokhara, the standpoint where today is the Shangri-La Hotel, the plane without any bloody buildings. It was the most beautiful spot on earth and I think it still is. You have to just to get out of the town a little bit into the fields. It's the most beautiful spot. 800 meters above sea level, the plane in the foreground and behind we have the high mountains up to 8,000 meters. The lake at that time was very clean, there was no uh, sewage in, the, in, the, play, in the, the lake, there were no buildings around the lake. That, this was uh, what we call the Swiss beach because I had my camp with my family very often on the hill above where is now Fishdale Lodge. Here there were some Tibetans who spending their winter time in Kathmandu earning some money with down season. I, of course, I was very keen to take movies of that. Uh, but until I had prepared my camera, he stopped. So I tried to get him, to motivate him to continue with the bloody dance. <laughs> then I had to run away to stop the camera. At the beginning, when my family was here in 52, 3, one year, they stayed here with my three children. They were very keen on to accompany me as far as it was possible on my field work. At the beginning, my field work in, was in the surrounding of Kathmandu, so we took them along, and when they got tired, they were carried in these baskets. This was my little daughter, Monica. She was two years old, she doesn't like it, and our dad, son Fritz, is also member of the party. Christopher, Catherine in the center. That is in the hill between Nagarjun and Tamkot. Over there is a beautiful view on Ganesh Himal. The air was very clean at that time. You can rarely see so clean again with all the air pollution. That is a school in far west near Bachang, I remember. 
open air school and I was the first foreigner there and so the teacher was very proud and when the, the students were looking at me and stopped learning he started shouting at them. He wanted to show how much discipline he has in with his students. <laughs> But I was, of course, more interesting for them. Now, oh, she's a nice boy. She's I like very much. You will see why. It just gets in action. There were very few schools at that time, but now uh, you have made, Rep has made a great progress where, in spite of the criticism of education systems, there uh, has been a great progress here. There's no doubt about this. That's eastern Nepal, when I crossed in from Darjeeling and went up the Singalila range towards Kanchenjunga. That's Kanchenjunga in the background. It's a beautiful trek over there on the ridge. It's a very good trail and there were guest houses there. On the Sikkim side, established by the English, uh, British colonial regime at that time already. It's very beautiful and no tourists, obviously, here. That's the United Nations flag. I have started my work as an employee of the Nepal government, then after less than one year I was taken up by UN. I was the first UN expert in Nepal and I became UN expert even before Nepal became member of the UN. Now we go east of Nepal, we see the money, the money walls in uh, Solu district, that is about uh, around salary. That is at Kempoche. I was there in 56. That was after Everest had been climbed. But still there were very, very few tourists because you had to walk either from, from uh, Terai or from, from, from Kathmandu right away up there. It took about two or three weeks. So these are some lamas from the famous monastery Tengpoche. They had no language problem at all. They spoke Tibetan, I spoke Swiss German, and you see, we have a very good understanding. <laughs> now we go up to the Everest base camp. Here I had to change my portals. My portals from the Midlands, they were not fit for the cold climate. That was towards uh, in, in December. Weather was very beautiful, but the nights were deadly cold, really. As soon as the sun disappeared behind the mountains, then the tea in my tent was frozen. When crossing into Kumbu from the west over Trezi Lapsa, I lost one port, but he was afraid, said, he said, the gods have decided we will have to die over there. I tried to send him back with a Sherpa back home. He flatly refused. So, against my will, <laughs> this is, they make some jokes, these were uh, Sherpa porters. And uh, so, on the top he sat down and after half an hour he was dead, simply dead. It was uh, very hard for us to continue afterwards. I remember for weeks we were thinking of that David. Uh, I was thinking should I have forced him to go back, but he, he just refused. So 
to be sure next time that such incidents would not happen again, I had then uh, brought morphium with me, morphium injections. This one most probably was a Tibetan. There were many Tibetans living all the time in, uh, in Kumbu. They have relatives with the Sherpas, the Sherpas cross over. This is Everest now with the Kwum, and I try to make my geological sketches. The sun was shining, but there was a terrible wind. I could hardly open my field book. So I took through my cross, crossings Nepal from east to west. Finally, I had 96 prof geological profiles prepared. I had a geological map prepared. But uh, this was just the base of my work. I had collected material on socio-economic development problems. And at the end, I had published two volumes for the United Nations. One was Geology and Natural Resources, Petroleum, Mines, Water Resources. And the other one was dealing with the people. And rightly, UN published the report dealing with the problems of the people as UN report number one of Nepal. And this report had been reprinted two years back at my 80th birthday at the UN Day by uh, Himal, Himal Association and by uh, UNDP. This is the Arun Bridge where supposedly this big dam should be built <coughs> over there. It's a masterpiece of engineering, knowing there are no nails, there is no wires, there is no metal used, <coughs> only very natural products, parks from the trees and so on. And it was a safe bridge. This was a really safe bridge. There are other bridges then you will see which are rather dangerous. This bridge, for example, that is in the Barun Valley, just a few tree trunks across, no fence, nothing. Or this one, that was uh, also in the Arun Valley, east of the Arun. We wanted to cross this to get to the other side, but obviously it has not been uh, used by people during the last year, so it was heavily damaged. Those strings uh, keeping the, the, the tree trunks on which we had to walk, they were partly missing, so my porters were very clever repairing this bridge, reinforced it, and finally crossed safely. I had a very good team when I said at four o'clock about here I would like to have the camp, I had not to say anything else. Everyone knew exactly what he, should, what he has to do, and it took not more than half an hour, and all the tents were erected and had my tea on my table. Then we had to several times to cross very high passes with snow on glaciers, and I had given some uh, light shoes for my portals. But once we had to cross a, st a steep slope in the snow, and then I saw from distance with my, with my binoculars that they, they did not wear the, the shoes, but they had bound them on their loads. I was frightened that they would get frozen, uh, frozen feet. Then I was shouting at them afterwards when I met them. Then they said, oh no, on steep slopes they feel much much better barefoot instead of shoes because they feel when 
they feel the grip of the ice or the snow, they feel more safe. So. This is now on the eastern, northeastern side of the Everest group. This is Makalu. Yes, this is Makalu. This is Chobolenzo. At the northeastern side already. That was taken in 1956. This is Makalu again. Chomo Lenzo. Makalu. That's my Sherpa Aida. I used him also as post runner and some other Sherpas. This is uh, Everest, the right mountain at the right side, the left side is Lotse, in between South Cole, from where the first ascents to Everest were made by the English, Danzig, and Hillary, and by the Swiss. Mount Everest, <coughs> comes from flank, northeast. That is a, from this side, there exist few pieces really. Now then, towards Christmas, always we went down. Towards the end of the year, uh, started the winter monsoon, and then we didn't want to be higher up in the mountains. Then we came down where it was more comfortable. That's my field camp with my small folding table. And then I was working on the profiles, drawing the maps, and making the fair copy of the with ink of the profiles here, here. I think I have been working here after in the Everest area. Say so my porters come and say, begin to ask to look on the map where have we been? And says so that's the place where we got the good chung. And that's the village where there were many good girls and so on. So they reminded these things and <coughs> this is my field office. Every evening in the tent I was working until 10, 11 o'clock because if one is an explorer is strained to the limit, you cannot leave it to the free wheel whether, whether you work or, or walk or not. So it has to be like a, uh, you need to have an iron discipline, you cannot leave it to up, up to your will. So uh, otherwise you, you lose, if you lose one day then you can't remember anymore what was before. This is a cross section also to Everest, what is this? It's Mount Everest, different formations. That is the eastern flank of the Everest where we could see all these structures. In the, the Nepali flank you cannot see much of the geology. This is a map would cover half of this wall here, the whole length of the wall and half of the height, covering the whole country in the scale of, what was it, quarter inch, yeah. The base was a survey made by the Survey of India in 1922, the quarter inch map, which was a masterpiece of survey work because uh, the Indian surveyors, the British surveyors were not allowed to enter Nepal, so they had to direct the whole survey from the Ganges Plain, from where the triangulation was made, from where they found out where the highest mountain of the world is. 
but they had to send hundreds of teams to this brain table. This is a Chari coat at that time, beautiful place with uh, Gauri Zankarling on the left side and Menlunze at the right side. This is of course in autumn during uh, Diwali, Diwali celebration. Then you find these wings, almost the whole country almost. And these big wheels of course. That is in eastern Nepal at the Limbo village, I can't remember exactly the name, where I dropped into a marriage ceremony, a big festival, and the people have obviously consumed a lot of chung already, and I was catching up very fast with the chung to encourage me to participate in this uh, dance. I was everywhere most welcome, all over the country except in Mustang, I got a chill reception at that time, because my Ayla always introduced me first, Colonel Saab, Hagim Saab, I was called Hagim Saab by my daughters and by the Sherpas, Hagim Saab, Hagim Saab, Colonel from Kathmandu, if this didn't work, he promoted me, he promoted me, uh, to the general shop from Kathmandu. <laughs> if this did not work in the northern part of the country where the Buddhist religion was, uh, was uh, where there were Buddhists, <laughs> he promoted me very big, very big Swiss Lama. And this worked. <laughs> but in Mustang, nothing. Is, now here you see Hagim Shop. <laughs> I was in a very good mood as I can see myself here now. <laughs> so these are my mail runners. I had to send them and then uh, about six weeks later we had to meet somewhere, somewhere in the country. And then, thanks God there were the big marketplaces, these were known to everybody. So we had agreed, I walked to continue my work for six weeks and then we met at a certain uh, marketplace. And in Kathmandu, then Father Moray and Father Neeson were handing my mail. Well, when, when I was in eastern western Nepal, it was sort of for my Sherpa to go straight south to get to the next Indian railway head. And then by train to India, to, uh, to New Delhi, where the then UNDP representative, James Keane, a close friend of mine, was the boss. So then, sometimes, then the mail from here, from Kathmandu, or from Pokhara went by the DC-3 down to Delhi, and then from Delhi to Zurich Airport, and then up by train and by bus to Lenzerheide. That was in the olden days, in the 50s, when we had the first DC-3s here. They brought the first ox cart there. They bought the first jeep. When the first jeep was unloaded here, and there always a lot of folks from the hills here looking here, the air traffic for one week or so. When the first jeep was taken out of a DC-3, 
saying they said this is the birth of a new airplane, this jeep will grow up, will grow wings and then it will be fly, flying. This is Lenzerweide, Lenzerweide our lake where my family lives there, it's still my home now. Beautiful place, tourist place. With the lock within 100 years to a tourist center with 14,000 tourist pets. And uh, we have well preserved our lake, it's uh, all protected, so not like the lake of Potovac, which, Pokhara, which has never been protected, and now you have the mess down there. That is uh, the postman, the Swiss Helvetic postman, this is uh, our chalet, this one, my wife at that time, in, that must have been in, in the 50s, with the three children. She calls the children, tells them that they had obviously still alive. Now, that's the end. Part of this movie will be used in the new movie, movie which is shot right now. I thank you very much.